So I had to put my teaching clothes back on today. I almost survived like the summer with barely having to wear my teaching clothes. Uh, if you're a guest here, welcome, and also online. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, my, my regular go-to apparel is a cut-off shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. I do hospital visitations that way, counseling that way, uh, uh, but I dress up for here, usually, unless I come up with a reason not to. Um, we, uh, I, it's been really neat, uh, I shared this many times, but I, I really believe something that God put on our, my heart was to have more voices here, uh, was the multiplication of leadership, and, and I believe that with all my heart. Somebody said, do you miss when you don't preach? Uh, yes. Yes, but not because I feel entitled to it. Uh, I miss it because you do love it. You have a heart for it as a pastor to teach, but you're, you're so humbled by the fact that God would call you to do that that you think you're not the only one that God can use here, right? And so uh, it was really neat to hear Josh preach uh, three times this summer. We're so glad he left Friday to go back to Liberty University. Do not call it Liberty College. Uh, Liberty University. Uh, and we're so grateful for his internship this summer and, and all of those things. And, and it's neat, too, to see this testimony. Um, uh, because you, you see young people. A lot of young people who, even in sharing their testimony, they understood they were there to build this church, right? To build the physical structure of this church. And, and, and so I want to put a challenge out first to, uh, I want to send out two challenges. First to you young people. Uh, the Lord has called us as believers to build the church, to edify the church. And, and if you go on a mission trip for one week to help build the physical structure of a church, you have to understand that God is calling you to be a part of building the church here too, uh, all the time. Uh, so don't, uh, don't feel like you have to wait once a year to go on a week to be a part of building the church. You have gifts. You are uniquely purposed and called by God, and your gifts can be used here because I don't believe you're the future of the church. I believe that scripturally you are the church, just like anybody else, and able to be used by God here to build this church. So, so don't just uh, come this, go to this week, and then we don't see See ya. Uh, look for ways to invest in the church, to be the church, because uh, you are church builders year-round. Amen? And I also want to put a challenge out. Uh, I've often said that my generation was self-righteous and this generation's entitled, <laughs> right? Uh, my generation was self-righteous, like, you know, how could, how could God uh, allow uh, bad things to happen to good people? <laughs> and, and this generation is that we are entitled to everything, uh, that, that God, why don't we have everything everyone else has? And, and, uh, and so, but sometimes ideologies and hearing things over and over again can cause us to despise the very people we're supposed to reach. And so if you are somebody who's not a young person, and that uh, I'm not going to go further, I'm not going to put that in the brackets, uh, but if you are someone who's not a youth, not a young person, ask yourself this question. If you, if you feel like teens can be entitled and you feel like teens, uh, ask yourself why then at this week did the testimonies we heard was just how hard they work? And ask yourselves, if, if, if they're able to one week unite the teens around a cause, can we do that? Can we share vision? Can we talk to them as the church, not just the future church, and help unite them around a vision to get them involved by being invested in them, right? So you see, it's a two-way challenge. So let's take this week and let's use that. Uh, I was also really blessed this morning as I was getting the mic on in the back uh, somebody years ago, there's a lot of new faces in this church, uh, but we've had people who've been a part of this church for years and, and have moved down south, a lot of them. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we had somebody who used to be a part of taking teens on, on annual missions trips, and he's here visiting us from, uh, what, North Carolina today, Mike Chance. We're so glad to see you, brother. Where are you? There he is. <laughs> I was like, I, I almost like ruined the microphone. I was like, is that Mike? So we're so glad you're with us, brother. It's been a long time. And also, I want to share a testimony about this. Uh, I talked to Pastor Sam on the phone Sunday night, like a day into this trip, and he shared that a 26-year-old came to know Christ as Savior during this trip. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, and we are, we're just so grateful uh, for that. I also wanted to share with you, uh, many of you know, uh, one of our youth named Aram. 
Um, he, he's often, uh, you might have seen him serving in the kitchen. He has a, he has a talent for um, culinary and has liked to learn about that. And, and a lot of you have gotten to know him as a part of our church. And, and uh, I wanted to let you know that he also works really hard in something that I always pronounce taekwondo, but he informed me that it's taekwondo. Did you know that? Say taekwondo. Practice that so we can get it right. And uh, he has worked hard for years to earn his black belt in that. And it turns out the New York State Fair, uh, he's going to be part of a group doing a demonstration of Taekwondo. If anyone would be interested in going out to the State Fair to support him, that's going to be on Saturday, August 24th at 1130 at the... um, the Asian Village section of the, the State Fair, uh, which is a big deal around here, isn't it? Uh, didn't I hear uh, that the State Fair coming up in August, I think they're going to let Christians in for free? <laughs> Did you hear that? They're, they looked at the, how Christians are often tried to be canceled and ostracized from society and looked down upon, so they said, we're going to let Christians in for free. Did you hear that? No, that's a different group they're letting in. But maybe someday they'll see that God's people have been very oppressed for years and let us in for free. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so anyway, so we've been preaching. Again, if, if you're new with us, uh, we've been preaching on the book of, oh, almost forgot announcements. See, I'm out of practice. I got a suit on and I forget things. So uh, church picnic, uh, September 8th this year, Sunday, September 8th, after service, we're going to have a church picnic at Dunham Manor Park, which is right around the corner. Um, we'd like everybody to bring a dish to pass. Um, it's a great way to bring food and to have it judged. I mean to share it with everybody. And so uh, please plan on bringing a dish to pass, and we're, that's going to be right after church on September 8th. Uh, we probably will have in the next couple of Sundays a sign-up sheet so we know who's bringing what. Um, and if you're afraid it's going to get judged, make up a name. I do it all the time. When you go to a place like, like a Panera where you order food, They don't say, can I have your name? They say, can I have a name? And I take full advantage of that. I give every kind of name you can imagine. I think of all the friends in my life who I've known with different names that I liked, and I use that name. Uh, also, um, I, there was, I, we, I think we sent out a church email, but there was one correction to the time of the services for, for David Tucci tomorrow. Um, so it's going to be a receiving time from 930 to 1130 right here. Uh, to come and to have an opportunity to see the, the pictures and to offer condolences to the family and to spend that time there. And then at 11.30 will be his, his service. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, according to David's wishes, you best believe the gospel is going to be shared. <laughs> uh, he, he wanted uh, his service while living. He wanted his service to do two things. He wanted to share the gospel to the lost and to unite believers. That was his, his exact words to me. <laughs> and, and that's what, uh, praise the Lord for that, that opportunity, right? Uh, David, uh, we're sad because we miss him, but we're not sad for him. He's doing way better than we are right now. <laughs> I prayed for years that God would heal him and give him a, 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 his, a, the best breath he's breathed in, in a long time. And God answered that prayer uh, a, a little over a week ago because he has no pain. He has no oxygen tubes. He has none of those things. Uh, and we're just, we're so happy for him to be done with the affliction of this tent. And, uh, and we celebrate his life. Man, we're going to miss him. We do miss him. We're going to miss him for, for a while because people are unique. People are treasures that God puts in our life for a purpose. And they're irreplaceable. Uh, but we rejoice for David. Amen. I think one of the coolest things is a Christian funeral. <laughs> So uh, we've been studying the book of Galatians. This is our, our sixth week in that. Uh, and, and even when Josh preached, he, he preached in accordance to going through the book of Galatians from July till the end of September. And so we, uh, where Josh left off was at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. So we're going to pick up at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. I'm going to start by reading the first couple of verses. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
And, and I think about the, the, that phrase, uh, put on Christ. What, what does it mean to put on Christ? And I was, I was looking at, at put on, uh, it, it comes from the Greek word induo. Go ahead, try it. Induo. Uh, for those listening at home, they said it way better than me. Trust me on that one. Uh, but and duo, and and uh, I think when when you look at it here, it says, "For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ." So, what is the thing that makes you a, uh, sons of God? Faith in Jesus Christ, and then it says, "For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ." Well, there's two other places where the word. And do all. That was good. Uh, there's, there's, there's a couple other places where that's used where I think it really helps us get an understanding of what it means to put on Christ. And I did not uh, get it in my notes, uh, so you might, if, you, if you're interested, write it down and turn to it. We'll have it up there. Uh, and I got to say that uh, when it, like our, our avian technologies team, right? So if, if there's a mistake on the screen on a Sunday, everybody notices, right? If the words don't get switched on time, if the image that's supposed to go up doesn't go up on time, and everybody turns and looks at that booth back there, and it, it's glaring. But what you don't know is the times that I fail them, okay? So I want to confess before the church, okay? I had a week this week that was, um, I want to say this the right way, it was filled with many, many opportunities. <laughs> and uh, they did not get my sermon notes until midnight this morning. And yet, they got those notes on the screen. So thank you guys. I, am, I apologize for that. Uh, you definitely try not to make a habit of that. Uh, some weeks full of opportunities, it does happen. But thanks, you guys, for your flexibility. Uh, I want to make sure, because th that would not be known, right? I don't click this. Nobody would know that you guys did this. So thank you guys so much. And I appreciate you and appreciate that. And um, but uh, it, it, what does it mean to put on Christ? Well, there's a couple of passages. I want to start uh, in Romans chapter 13, where it uses the same word, which is? Good job. I don't think I'd remember if I didn't see it right here in bold on my notes. Uh, but Romans chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 8, and I'm going to read through 14. It says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who, loves, um, who, he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, and you shall not steal. You shall not bear fall witness, you shall not cover it, covet. If there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Wait. And now it's even nearer than when I just said that. Uh, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on. Guess what word that is? The armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on. Guess what word that is? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Do you see what you're starting to get an idea of here? Uh, to put on Christ is to put off what? <laughs> Right? It, it's uh, a lot of Christians like to treat the Word of God like a buffet, and they like to have their cake and eat it too. I, I want, I, I'm somebody who, want, you know, uh, I want to believe that Jesus Christ is Savior. Uh, but so I, I'm going to say a prayer and then justify all the sin in my life. Right? Uh, I, I'm going to keep on both things. I'm going to put on Christ and also put on, put on the lust of the flesh and be okay with that. But you see here, and, and I read it again, I'll, uh, not the whole thing, but starting from verse 12, it said, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no 
provision for the flesh to fulfill its life. So you start to see the picture that you're putting on Christ, but you're also taking off something, aren't you? And I want you to know that this is not all. If I turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 17 through 24. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on, which is... And that you may put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So again, where you see in duo is the idea that you're putting on Christ, but what are you taking off? Yes, self and the lust of the flesh and all of these things. We we need to remove those things. Because would you agree that those things can blur our vision of what God is calling us to, can it? And sometimes we feel invincible. I can know Christ. I can justify sin in my life. And I'm just going to keep plowing forward. But I want you to know that that, that's a weight in a backpack. That is something that blurs your view. Uh, I was just talking to a a young believer. um, And it always is really, really neat. Uh, when, when you hear a testimony of a young believer, especially when they're in, in that part where they're going to like a secular college, you're supposed to say, oh, man. Uh, so like you, you know, uh, you don't have to look far or read much to know the funnel of depravity that exists in these places. Amen. (laughs) Right. And so, um, you, you go there, and, and uh, what's really neat is to hear a testimony of a young believer who, in that environment, felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit and said, I'm going to align my life with Christ. I want to use this as an opportunity not to blend in. Not, not just like it even, it even said there about living as the Gentiles live. There is nothing that distinguishes me as a believer from somebody who is an unbeliever, but to say, I want to stand out for Christ. And I want you to know that uh, as I was looking at the, these, these next two sermons today and next week, uh, I even asked this person if they would come, this young person, and share their testimony as a part of my sermon next week. Because it's beautiful to see a young person uh, look at the depravity of the world and, and come to a place where they realize they even kind of blended in with it sometimes. But to say, the Lord convicted me. The Lord convicted me, and now I want to stand out. I don't want to live like everybody else. I want to be a light in that darkness, and I want to live for him. That, that's an awesome, awesome testimony. It's a reason I asked them to share it as a part of next week's sermon. Amen? Amen. Are our young people hopeless? No, God is moving. He's moving in their lives. And, and, and what we have to understand at all ages is that to put on Christ, okay? We put on Christ, but we also have to put off all of those other things that don't glorify him, that aren't according to his standards. And that's what we're being called here. Back to Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up uh, in verse 28 where we left off there. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I want to make very, very clear that uh, if, if you were popcorning Scripture and you were trying to make church blend in with secular, godless ideologies, which should never be what we do, because the Bible makes clear those are two separate things. Friendship with the world is what? 
enmity with God. You can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. Those two things were never made to mix, but sometimes what Christians do in this day and age, especially in our culture, is they treat the Word of God like a buffet. I'm going to accept and believe and apply the parts I'm comfortable believing, but then I'm going to water down other parts that don't fit secular godless ideology. And when we do that, we are essentially bowing down to the God of secular ideology and saying, we bow down to you and worship you also. But let that not be so amongst Christians, amen? We can't bow down to that God. We have to have Christian godly standards. And it would be tempting to even read something that says, in Christ there, there is neither male nor female. And make that into something that secular ideology is trying to convince you of that you know is not true according to Scripture. This is not saying that there is no such thing as a male and no such thing as a female and that they are one. Because you have to remember that this is talking about putting on Christ. And I want you to know that there is equal value to all people. It doesn't mean there's no such thing as a Jew or a Greek. There's no such thing as a man or a woman. <laughs> That's secular ideology. This is saying equal value right? And so that's what's really, really neat about the Word of God. Christians get accused of a lot of things. The Word of God gets accused of a lot of things. But if you looked at people through God's eyes, there would not be bias. See, what the secular does is they say, hey, we want to tell you, don't be biased. So what we're going to do is we're going to group people together on the basis of race and gender and make sure we discuss them as all different, but as a group, they all think the same, experience the same. And there's no individuality. That's the opposite, right? You're, you're actually stoking the fire of bias by saying all of these people have had the same experience and we're group them together and we're going to tell you how you should view this people as different from this people. Secular is wrong. They're stoking the very thing they claim to be trying to extinguish. But God, we know in Scripture, is no respecter of person. Samuel showed up at the house of Jesse, and he looked at the biggest, strongest, oldest son and said, that must be the person I'm anointing as king. And he went down the chain of sons of Jesse. And then there was none left in the house. So he was told there's this other son. What, David? Out in that field there. And God said to Samuel, you see as man sees, but God looks at the heart. See, there are only two groups of people in this world, according to Scripture. And that's believers and unbelievers. That's it. There is nobody on this earth that God has called us to look down our noses at or up our noses at. I was just sharing, I was sharing a story in uh, Sunday school the morning, uh, the, this morning because we're studying the book of James, chapter 2, where it talks about the not to have personal favoritism and bias and, and how God is not a respecter of persons and that God doesn't value people and put people on the scale on the basis of, of income or race or any other factor right? Every person is individually uniquely created by God. And when we look at people through the eyes of God, there is nobody below us or above us. Amen? And so um, uh, what, what you often run into is when the secular ideology creeps into a church, uh, a church is likely to make statements like this. One of the statements I most despise that's a first world problem. You know what you just done? You demonized a group of people that God has called you to reach. You've then taken another group of people that God's called you to reach and caused you to believe that the best thing you could offer this person is something material. But it's not true. Because if I give every, somebody everything I have, and I don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. I've given them nothing. I've given them nothing. And if I walk by a rich man because he's wealthy and 
secular ideology have caused me to look up my nose at him and say there is nothing that he needs. That's the, that's the opposite side of the same coin. I have allowed myself to despise and overlook someone that God has called me to reach. And in this church every year, for, for several years, we used to do something called cold kits. Some of you remember. We would pack these bags that had things for surviving the cold, uh, the cold gloves and hats and scarves and some non-perishable foods and chapstick and tissues and, and all of that type of thing to survive the, the cold winters up here in the Northeast. And uh, we'd go out, we usually pack about 70 bags. And we'd go out and we'd go into areas of primarily Utica that was the most impoverished. And we would split up into groups of four or five and spread out and just look for people to give this blessing to and to share the gospel with. And in the bags was also a gospel presentation. And we would go out and do that. And I remember one year, my tie's coming undone, too used to wearing cutoffs. Uh, uh, I remember one year, uh, the group I was in, we were walking and we had our bags and this, this, there was a man across the street and he pulls up to go into the store and he was driving this really nice car, right? Really nice car. And he gets out and he's wearing this really nice jacket, the really nice leather gloves. And he just had a hat on that you just can't wear unless you're wealthy. And so he, he gets out of his car and I said, okay, who wants to go and offer a bag to him? And, and, and the people in my group were like, he doesn't need to look at his car, look at his clothes. And I was like, who are we to judge on a person's appearance what they need and don't need? So I said, come on, I'll go. And we walk over and I said, sir, here's what we're doing today. And I want, uh, you know, would you like one of these bags? And, and he said, oh, no, no, no. He's like, I, I'm fine. Uh, you should give that to somebody who really needs it. And so I said, well, sir, I was like, do you know of anybody who really needs it? And he's like, uh, I, I don't know. I was like, would you mind helping us? Would you take a couple bags and find someone who needs it and give it to them? And he was like, huh, uh, well, you know, I'm kind of in a hurry. I was like, is anywhere on your travels, anybody in your family, anybody you see as you drive by, can you think of anybody who might need this? And would you give this to them? <laughs> and he said, I, I really, I, I just don't have time. I'm sorry. I, I just, I don't think I can. And then I said, is there anything you do need? And he said, uh, you know, uh, not, I don't think so. I can't think of anything. I was like, how about prayer? Is there something that I can pray for you about? And he told me, I can't remember which parent is one. One of his parents was very, very ill. And that was a burden on his heart. So I said, would you mind if I pray for them? And he goes, oh, sure, yeah, I'd appreciate that. I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so on the street in Utica, we prayed for his parent that was sick. And, and after praying, his, his eyes were just welled up in tears. And then I asked him about his faith. And I got to share the gospel with this man. Now, I could have easily, we could have, avoided him based on his appearance. He looks too wealthy to help. But God is no respecter of persons. Whether in wealth or whether in, pro in poverty, there are believers and there are unbelievers. You want to solve things like bias and racism? Just see people through the eyes of God. Because what they're telling you is the solution is really the problem. They're not looking through people through the eyes of God, of equal value. And in Christ, they're all the same. In Christ, there we can have no bias, because he doesn't. When the rich young ruler came and Jesus had told him, you know, uh, unless you sell everything you have and give it to the poor, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I want you to know that there are depraved pastors today that preach online and in churches, they even write books on it, that will try to tell you that somehow your salvation is based upon the works of selling everything you have and giving it to the poor. One of these pastors is worth $6 million. According to my Bible, it says there is nothing we can boast in salvation, right? Right? Do I have that right? 
So the Lord doesn't come and look at all believers and separate them for eternal glory on the basis of how much they've given to the poor, right? I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. That the basis is one. Receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God has made one way. One way. Now the manifestation of that faith should cause us to have compassion for everyone should cause us to want to use what God has given us to bless those around us. It should not be used to demonize people with because they need the Lord too. And they need to be reached. I often think when Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven or it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven, uh, some people look at that as an excuse to dismiss the wealthy who need the gospel like anybody else. I think it was a challenge. I think it was a challenge. You drive by a poor community and you want to pull over and help that poor community, but then a lot of times you drive by a rich community and you stick your nose in the air because they don't need you. But everybody needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. That wealth is fulfilling nothing. That wealth does nothing for their eternity. And so we serve a God who has no bias of any kind. He's called us to have compassion for everyone. If you see somebody who is a believer, our job is simple, to edify them, to hold them accountable, and to be a loving brother or sister in Christ. And if you see someone who is an unbeliever, the mission is even simpler than that to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them without worrying about how they receive you or if they reject you. And when you view people through that lens, there is no bias on the basis of economics, on the basis of skin color, or the basis of anything else. Because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if God chose you to be born in a first world country, then use that opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in that first world country. If God has caused you to be born in a third world country, then use that opportunity to reach third world country with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God has caused you to be born in a first world country and given you a heart for missions to go to a third world country, then obey him for the simple reason that you don't want to end up in the belly of a fish. <laughs> obey him with the heart he's given you for these people to do what? Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I shared this in Sunday school, and I, I was jokingly saying, if I preached a, a sermon whose theme was this in this world today, it would be like daggers, right? Uh, but, but here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and understand that this is part in context where he's talking about marriage. He's saying that like uh, marriage is not a cure for the disease of singleness, uh, singleness can be used for God's glory too, amen? I, I wrote a Bible study years ago called Singular Focus, and it was for uh, primarily, it doesn't have to be young, but it was, it was for Christian singles who sometimes there can be a culture amongst Christianity. I used to call it the hymn ministry. Raise your hand if you ever heard of the hymn ministry. And I know you're thinking of getting together and singing hymns, but this is H-Y-M-M. Have you met my ministry? For years, there's been a culture in churches where if you see a single young person, you say, hey, have you met my? <laughs> we got to get them married. We got to get them married. You can't be single. And then you turn to 1 Corinthians and you're like, Paul's like, if you're single, it's kind of a good thing right now. Use it for the Lord. Amen? Amen. He does tell us it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And we know that Paul was gifted with the gift of celibacy, right? But, but listen, like, uh, you know, singleness is not a disease. And this cure is not marriage. Singleness is to be used for the glory of God the way that marriage is supposed to be used for the glory of God. 
And here, in that context, in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 17, it says this, starting in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 7. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordained in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. What is this? If I said this is a politician, I'd be crucified. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the same state in which he was called. Because even if you are a slave in the flesh, even if you are oppressed in the flesh, in Christ you are free. Do you know why? Paul and Silas, after being severely beaten and shackled and thrown in the deepest part of the prison, do you know why they were singing praises to God? Because they were free. They were in humanity's jail cell, being persecuted for their faith. But they could sing because there is no jail cell in all the world. There is no level of oppression there is no economic status that can take away the freedom you have in Christ. And that's what they know, and that's what Paul is saying. We concern ourselves with material things, and we look at freedom through the lens of material things. But it's not to be so. Where God has you is where God wants you. Use that for his glory. And then be amazed at where you end up. The Christian life is such an adventure. It's not a series of rules that we legalistically follow, and that's the heart of Christianity, uh, uh, boasting in our own self-righteousness of faith. We, it's about knowing God's will by doing God's will. We can twiddle our thumbs and say, when I get out of this situation, then I will serve the Lord. When my life becomes less chaotic, then I will serve the Lord. When I become more financially independent, then I will serve the Lord. That's not what this is saying. The plate you have in front of you right now, no matter how big or small it is, you use right now to fulfill your purpose in being exactly who God wants you to be right now. And you know what? The Bible's clear. It tells us how to live right now. It tells us what, what the desire of our heart should be right now. It tells us how to glorify God and how we speak and how we live and all these things right now. So do that right now where you are. Do that to the max. And I promise you, you will be amazed at where you end up. Because we can twiddle our thumbs and complain about our situation and say we're seeking God's will. You can't seek God's will if you're not doing God's will. So you start by doing God's will right where you are, right here. I want you to know in my life, I got that wrong. I got that wrong. When God first called me to ministry, I, I just assumed all I've ever seen is this is how it, it happens. You, 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 you sense a call to ministry from God. So the first thing you have to do is, is uh, get thrown into the youth department. Isn't that right, Pastor Sam? <laughs> Anybody called the ministry, you got to start in the youth department, right? And then you serve in the youth department for a while, and you go to seminary, and you get a degree, and you can get a couple of them, and you can hang them up on your wall. Isn't that awesome? And then uh, because of all that, you then get promoted out of the, the basement of youth ministry. That's where most churches do youth ministry. Uh, you get promoted from the basement of youth ministry to another ministry position. And then uh, some church somewhere needs a pastor. So you apply, you get the job. And by 26, you're the head pastor of a church. 
You're ordained. You've got your certificates. You're a head pastor. You went through all the steps that pastors go through. And it's not like you're not serving the Lord in that time. It's not like you're, pas- you're not passionately running after him during a time. I was. I, I was on fire for God during that time. But in my head, I had a picture for how this is supposed to go, where this is supposed to go. And sometimes I'd get frustrated if it wasn't going there fast enough. And then for a couple years, all that was gone. All that was gone. I felt rejected. I felt spit out. And I felt there is no way I'm ever going to be in ministry after the first nine years. So then the Lord, who does have a sense of humor, don't believe he doesn't, he, uh, he brought me here to this area. And, uh, and I, I was a pastor friend who was helping me through a difficult time and, and spiritually rehabbing me. And he said, when I told him I was moving out here for work, he said, you know, you can go to any church you want, but the first church that you have to visit and try is called Clinton Road Baptist Church. There's a good friend of mine named Pastor Sam Macri who pastors that church. And I don't care where you go, but you got to go there first. And so I did what he said. I walked into Clinton Road Baptist Church over on 12B in New Hartford, and I never left. <laughs> I never left. I, and what's different, what's so unique about my time in Clinton Road is feeling ministry was behind me. I had no trajectory. I had nothing, no steps that I saw my life taking. When God called me back to, to the very thing, he never stopped calling me to. The mentality was different here. It was, I'm going to maximize for the Lord whatever is in front of me. I'm going to go all in for this plate that God has in front of me. I'm going to learn God's will by doing God's will right now, right here in this thing. And I want you to know that in the past, going on 16 years, okay, I've been called a lot of different things in this church. Right, Pastor? (laughs) I had a lot of different titles. I can't remember them all. But that's what was neat about this time around. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what they call you. It was do what's in front of you. Do the will of God here now. Do the will of God in your family. Do the will of God in your church. Try as hard as you can, no matter how many times you fail, to glorify him with your life. Whether you're at church or at home or at work or any other place, do that. And what's amazing is 16 years you wake up and you're the senior pastor of that same church. (laughs) I'm telling you, doing God's will, doing God's will where you are, Do not have to worry about knowing what God's will is for you 10 years from now or 16 years now. Do what is God's will now. Live his way now. Put on Christ. Put off the darkness of this world and the darkness of this flesh and just maximize what God is calling you to do right here, right now, in front of you. That's why I told the young people, you don't have to travel to Tennessee to build a church. Because... The the Christians are called to the church building business all year round because the church is not a building. The church is people. And God blesses us with these buildings. You know that building that you invested in? Do you know that there are going to be people who come to faith in Jesus Christ in that building? Do you know that there are believers who are going to grow in their relationship with Christ in that building? There are going to be missionaries sent out to places in the world from that building. So praise the Lord for your investment. But the the church is people. And you, you have just as much a calling to building the church here as you do in Tennessee. And that applies to all of us of all ages. We have to maximize what's in front of us. And what's in front of us now is that we are here. We are here. It's one of the amazing things I think about with someone like David Tucci. Do you ever think for a moment, you ever, you ever stand in a room of people and ask yourself why you know everybody? Because just the other day, I stood in this building and 
I had a person from South Florida named Angela standing here, a guy named Mike and David and Anthony, Frank, Steve, Becky, Doug, Jim. This entire group of people from all over the place, all walks of life, all backgrounds, we are here because David is the commonality, right? But check this out. I guarantee you, in no way, shape, or form, because I am not a car guy, without Christ, I never would have known David. Do you ever look around and say, it is only because of Christ that I'm surrounded by this group of people? And when Psalms 139 says that everybody is created with purpose, uniquely created with purpose, everyone's a treasure. Did you ever look around and say that it is because of Christ that I am surrounded by these treasures? Without Christ, I would not know these treasures. And when you take a step back from how chaotic life can be, or as I shared before, the weeks that have many, many opportunities. Isn't that a better way of saying it? Try that. So this week when you're stressed and you feel stretched like Gumby, say, Lord, you've given me a lot of opportunities this week. <laughs> and I'm going to need to depend on you and, and I'm going to need your strength to engage in all of these opportunities you've given me. But you maximize what God is calling you to do right here in this moment with these people around you, with this thing, with this maximize what it can be for the glory of God. And that's how you will find God's will by knowing God's will. And then finally, and as we keep on in Galatians here, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 say this. And this is beautiful. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave. Though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Raise your hand if you have ever struggled with self-worth. If your hand is down, I promise you that somehow you found a way to skip the teenage years. I would dare say we have all at some time struggled with self-worth. So here in the beginning of chapter 4, it's talking about a child born in royalty. And would you agree that a child born into royalty is already entitled to and inherent to the same power that his parents have? Right? That their parents have. And so it says here that even though he is master of all, during the younger portion of his life, they're mostly raised by guardians and stewards of the royal family, aren't they? And in a lot of ways, they are subject to the guardians and stewards of the royal family. They are reared and disciplined and raised by the guardian and stewards of the royal family. And he says, so even though they're born as master of all, in the beginning of their life, they are still like slaves, right? And this is an analogy, because it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Here's what's incredible about what Christ has done. Okay, because we are, we are oppressed and slaves of sin. And what God did is he sent his son, that sin that creates that gap between us and God, that sin that, that oppresses us, that enslaves us. In 1 John it says, all of the secular, godless world is under the sway of the wicked one. 
And Jesus shed his blood and died and rose again to make a way not only that we can be forgiven and freed from that oppression, but that we would be called sons and daughters of God. When we struggle with self-worth, we're comparing, we're comparing corruptible with corruptible, mortal with mortal. But we have this invitation from God, not just to know him as God, but to know him as Father, to be a son and heir of royalty, eternal royalty. Self-worth? Brothers and sisters, if you know Christ as Savior, we are princes and princesses to the almighty king of the universe. That's what we have been invited into. And I want you to know that equally to talking about how to maximize the plate in front of us, you meet people all the time who have not had a good upbringing. I guarantee you there are those in this room who had a really tough upbringing who have felt betrayed and hurt by the people who were supposed to protect and love them. There are people in this room who don't know what it means to have a relationship with a father on this earth. But you are not fatherless. You are not fatherless. The best father on earth is going to let you down. The best father on earth is imperfect, is, is imperfect and is guaranteed to let you down. But you are not fatherless because Christ didn't just die to forgive you of sins, but to be invited to be a son of the living God, to be an eternal heir. The same promise given to Abraham that his seed would be like the sands of the shore and the stars in the sky. Do you know that you are a part of that family if you know Jesus? Do you know that you have been adopted into that perfect, eternal family if you know Jesus? That's why Jesus said in the end times, look, it says father uh, will, will go against son and mother against daughter. It says that your own family will deliver you up to councils for Christ's sake. And when Jesus was teaching and, and, his, and, and Jesus' mother Mary and his half-brothers were at the door, they said, Lord, your mom and brothers are outside. And so Jesus said, well, I'm going to drop everything, all ministry and everything here because they're, they're my biological family. What did he say? Yeah, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Is it not you here? And that's what we have to understand. Time after time as a pastor, it gets so frustrating sometimes. I'm having conflict and chaos within my biological family, so I'm going to step away from the church for a while. That is when you need the church the most. When you feel rejected and hurt and struggling with biological family, cling to your brothers and sisters in Christ who cling to their perfect heavenly Father, the King of all kings, the Almighty God of the universe. That's what we get to be adopted into. We so often run away from that because of what our life in this world is like. But we need to be running towards that. We need to be embracing the fact that God has surrounded us with brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what we have in common? is not a blood type, but the blood of Jesus Christ. Because blood might be thicker than water, but the blood of Christ is thicker than anything else. And that bond, we have an entire Bible that teaches us how to do that right. And we don't. So what happens is, is somebody has a conflict in the church and they leave that church. Do you leave your family when you fight with your brothers and sisters? <laughs> or do you come back to Thanksgiving the next year? <laughs> Listen, we often hold the church to standards we won't hold in our own life. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I promise you we're going to get on each other's nerves. I promise you there will be conflict. We will be rubbed the wrong way. Guaranteed. Because the church has this in common with the world is we are full of sinners. 
And so when we have a disturbance in a relationship, we say, oh, I have to leave this church because the other church has brothers and sisters who will never hurt me. And I really like their music. And they do this one thing. Oh, it's awesome. I had somebody tell me once, Pastor, if you ever stop unapologetically standing on the word of God, I'm going to leave this church. And I said, shame on you. Why would you leave the church because of one dude? It's like, fire me. <laughs> but do you see the mentality? You could have somebody sick. Twelve people from the church will surround them, support them, and visit them. But if the pastor hasn't in the last four days, because he's had a lot of other opportunities, then the whole church has failed them. You see the problem with that? According to 1 Corinthians 12, the church is people. And there is no person, no part of that body that's more important than another. And if you've been surrounded and visiting by your church, by your brothers and sisters, celebrate that. Celebrate that. If I ever become an indictment on the whole church, then we have lost perspective of what the church is. But how often do we want to run away from a church because of conflict with our brothers and sisters? We get into such conflict with our brothers and sisters that we take our eyes off our daddy. And it causes separation in the church. And Satan, the enemy, glories in that. He rejoices every time we take our eyes off our daddy and get caught up in the relationship struggles amongst ourselves. But we have been called to keep our eyes on daddy. That's what Abba Father is. Abba is a more intimate way of saying Father. We haven't just been invited into a relationship with God like he's Santa Claus and we send letters of prayers to the North Pole and hope he'll come. He is a personal daddy. We can have an intimate relationship with the God of the universe because he's our daddy and we are his children. And there is no circumstance in your life that can separate you from the love of our father God. When the prodigal son left the house and spoiled his inheritance and he found himself eating with pigs, he thought, maybe if I go back and just be one of my father's servants, even they're treated better than this. But he came back to find that he was always a son. And he might have run away, but God didn't run away from him. <clears throat> and the word there, where it says in verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. You notice how I said that? I want you to know that I said that wrong. The word crying out comes from the word kradzo. Try that one. But here's the deal. It means to shriek, to scream. So try that word again. No, no, no. It means to scream. Try that again. So the spirit is kradzo. I'm sorry to wake you up. It's crying out, shrieking out, shouting out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. That's what the Spirit is doing within us. It's not a whisper. It's not a vague idea of the somewhat presence of God in our life. The Spirit kradzos out. Do it again. <laughs> but now kradzo, Abba, Father. <laughs> yeah. That's what the Spirit cries out from within us, amen? And this is not the only place in Scripture. I'm going to close with this in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, putting on Christ, taking off the flesh... You will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we crodzo. That was not crodzo. That was like zo. I'm going to read it again, okay? The spirit of adoption by whom we crodzo. That was better. We'll get there, but not today. We don't have time to get there today. We're going to get there, though. We cry out, Abba, Father. But notice what it says in 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we crodzo. Abba, <laughs> Judy, I, I'm going to give you a gold star on that one. She, she took a deep breath because she knew it was coming, and she just let it out, right? But notice how it says, for you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. Uh, a few years ago, I, uh, the Lord led me to write a Bible study called Spirit of Fear. And the, the second week of that study was called Returning to Egypt. And it talked about the bondage of fear. But it emphasized that word again. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. And I want to read you just a short excerpt, a paraphrase excerpt from that study that kind of uh, talks about that. It says, the word again comes from the Greek word palin, which describes something like the pendulum on a grandfather clock, swinging back in the exact path from which it came. The Bible says here that in Christ, we did not receive the spirit of bondage palin to fear. We didn't receive in Christ bondage that brings us back to fear. Through faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, Romans 8.15 says that we received a spirit of adoption as joint heirs with Christ. There is bondage in fear. The only thing that sets us free from that bondage is faith in Christ. Righteous fear is the reverent worship and total trust in who God is and who we are not. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord, yes, we fear him with that godly fear, but through him we are set free from the bondage of sin and the bondage of fear. If Christ sets us free from the bondage of fear, then why would a believer ever return again back to that bondage? Numbers chapter 14 shares the factually true historical event of when Moses sent spies into the land of Canaan. When 10 of the 12 spies returned with a bad report, do you remember what the congregation of Israel did? Numbers 14 verses 1 for 4 says this, So all the congregation lift up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us, out, brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? where they were slaves, by the way. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Moses was tasked to lead them to the promised land. They wanted to select a leader that would lead them back to bondage. Think about what they are saying here. They were afflicted and in bondage to the Egyptians for 400 years. Then God sent incredible plagues upon Egypt to free his people from that bondage. He parted a great sea to lead them out of that bondage. He fed them with bread from heaven. He freed them, protected them, provided for them. And he promised them a land flowing with milk and honey that he was giving to them. And after all that, they take one look at the descendants of Anak, the descendants of Anak, and they're ready to go back to the place of bondage. The choice was trust the same God that has proven his might time and time again to keep his promise or live as slaves. And they wanted to live as slaves. Since 2020, I've noticed a trend. Many pastors, preachers online 
have become completely devoted to talking about nothing else but the end times. I want you to know that there is bondage and fear. And if anybody is trying to get you to do the will of God by being afraid, make like Joseph and run. Because in Christ we are set free from the bondage of fear. And we are not to palin to return again to it. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. And most people use fear as a way of control. And so what happens is we stoke a fear about the end times. And we get people because the American bubble has been popped a couple times and we're starting to see what our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world have been seeing for hundreds of years. We overreact. We set our hair on fire. And we say, oh, this is the only thing that matters. But listen to this. I want to make this very clear because people ask me about this all the time. End-time prophecy was not given to us as an equation to be solved. It is a promise to be celebrated. It's not given to make us afraid of the future, but to give us purpose in the present. And we have an entire word of God, including revelation, that he tells us that we are to be ready by doing his will. And he's given us his will. We're to pursue purity in Christ like this. We're to reach the lost like never before because right now is closer than it was three seconds ago when I started this sentence. We don't have to stoke fear to inspire believers. Because if you're afraid of the end times then I'm concerned for your soul. Because this is a promise to be celebrated. The return of Christ is something for us to look forward to. It should inspire us to invite more people to look forward to it. It should inspire us to live godly before him in our lives. But it is not put there as an equation to be solved. And if you're spending your time trying to solve that equation, you're missing the point of end-time prophecy. It is something to be celebrated, not feared. Amen? Amen? Because fear is bondage. And we have been not adopted into, into an adoption of fear, but an adoption of freedom. And heir as children of the, uh, of the Almighty God that we can cry out, Abba, Father. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing for us to fear if you know Christ the Savior. And I'm sorry to tell you, if you're here today and you don't know Christ the Savior, you have everything to fear. But I want you to know you're surrounded by a bunch of people in this room that would love nothing else but to help you find this Savior that has set us free. And I don't want you to leave here without knowing that. I don't want you to leave here without talking to somebody about that. Because that's what we have in Christ. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of affliction. You don't have to be afraid of oppression and persecution. Because we are free in Christ. And we should kradzo that, huh? I'm going to have the praise team come up as I read one more passage from the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. Starting in verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, he may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray. Father God, there have been so many times in my life when I lost sight of the adventure that I have and the freedom that I have in you. 
There have been so many times, Lord God, where I looked at my circumstances, where I looked at what somebody else had and I didn't. And I let that change my ambitions, my goals. But Lord God, you have constantly convicted and reminded me that who I am can't be measured by anything in this world. It can't be measured by anything in this flesh. Because you have said that I am your son. I am a son of the almighty living God. That's who I am. In all the times in my life where I've wrestled and struggled with identity and finding my place and finding where I belong, you have always reminded me I belong in you. To put off my old self and put on you. Lord, even within Christian circles, it's easy to get caught up in fear, to get caught up in conflict and relationship issues. But Lord, let us never lose sight of our daddy. Let us never get so caught up in what's to our left and right that we forget who you are. And we forget that it's you who we live for. We forget that we're where we are because you purposed us to be here. Lord, help us to maximize every moment, every day, every week, every month, every year, to seek to do what we know to be your will in the word of God, to try to be like you, to live like you, to love like you, to see like you. And that through that, Lord, we won't be searching for your will. We'll be living in it, in the wonderful, wonderful adventure that is your will. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that it wasn't enough just to save us, but to invite us into that relationship with you, our daddy. Thank you for being a perfect father as an example. And Lord, help us never to let anything else define who we are in you, to not let this world turn our hearts and our minds away from your truth, to think we are anything other than who you created us to be. Lord, as always, I just pray as a church, Lord God, that we will continue to be everything you're calling us to be. In your precious name I pray, amen.